This is Europe and the United States in the 20th century. This is the lecture for the on the uh, transatlantic masters program. We are now on class number five, which deals with the 1930s. So the title of the United States and the challenge of fascism in Europe. OK. OK, the first couple of slides basically summarize some of the points that we have made in previous classes. And I don't want to dwell on them. It's talking a little bit about the 1920s. Um, the general argument, though, that we made was that it's something of a misnomer to say that the United States was entirely isolationist in the 1920s. We've noticed that the United States was involved to some degree in European affairs. We mentioned the Dawes Plan, the Young Plan, uh, the Washington Naval Conference, uh, the kellogg briand Pact, etc., etc., etc. And the general argument, I suppose, we made was that, yes, Wilsonianism, the Wilsonian flame, if you like, was still to some degree flickering during the 1920s. So it's not entirely true to say that Wilson's vision was entirely rejected after... Uh, the United States Senate refused to ratify the peace agreements that uh, Wilson came back to America with from Paris in 1919. Okay, today though I want to concentrate on the 1930s and especially the policies of Franklin Roosevelt um, in relation to Europe and I want to try and address the question um, as to the extent to which the Roosevelt administration supported Britain and France's policies of appeasement towards Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. Um, that is a question which has generated quite a lot of debate among historians. And I think one of the reasons why there has been so much debate is that I, th my own view anyway, is that it's very hard to pin Roosevelt down on this issue. Um, he had a habit of saying different things to different people. Um, so Roosevelt himself, I mean, he has a remarkably sort of elusive quality to him. And I think that's one of the reasons why perhaps he has attracted so much fascination among historians. But um, as I say, why there has been so much debate. Um, so yeah, as I say, the main focus today, as I say, will be on that particular question. That basically means I'm going to pass over the next couple of slides very quickly. Again, it's more or less just recapitulating some of the things that we've we've already talked about. The general point on this is that, again, as we've talked about in previous sessions, Germany is sort of rehabilitated during the 1920s. You have the Locarno Treaties. Germany enters the League of Nations um, and in short, as I said before, by the mid-1920s, there were reasons for optimism in Europe. Think people were basically saying that perhaps indeed the worst was over. Of course, at the end of the decade, as we all know, you have the financial crisis, November 1929, um, given to what's happening today at the moment, this all has a fairly uh, sort of familiar ring to it. Um, the Wall Street crash, um, and as we say today, you know, what happens on Wall Street eventually filters its way through to Main Street. The overall effect, and again, I'm not going to go through every single point on this PowerPoint here, but the main effect is that it has, re it, the, the crash has reverberation, sorry, that's the wrong, <laughs> try again, reverberations right the way around the global economy. In particular, international trade dries up as various countries, including the United States and most countries in Europe as well, um, start erecting protectionist barriers in an effort to try and insulate their own domestic economies. Um, as a consequence, as I say, world trade dry, dries up. You have their statistics at the bottom there. Um, and one by one, not all right at the same time. Some countries go into depression or recession earlier than others, but why one by one, virtually all the world's industrialized economies 
um, are gravely affected by the uh, by the, uh, uh, the you know the global economic situation. The only country which to, which is more or less unscathed, the only industrialized economy which is more or less unscathed, of course, is the Soviet Union, which was never obviously part of the global capitalist system to begin with. So moving on to our next slide, we'll talk. Um, this discusses the Hoover administration. Again, I really want to get on to Franklin Roosevelt, so I'm going to skip over Hoover. Suffice to say, I mean, <clears throat> Hoover um, at the time, certainly, and I think in popular opinion, is not thought to have done a particularly good job in combating the worst effects of the Depression. Um, certainly, his record is often contrasted rather unfavorably with that of his successor, Franklin Roosevelt. It's certainly true Hoover was not particularly interested in direct government intervention in the economy, in the, which would be one of the hallmarks of the Roosevelt administration. Um, on the other hand, I think it is not entirely true to say that who's sorry that Hoover was um, entirely um, what's the word I'm going to say unconstructive if that's a word I'm not entirely sure that it is but yeah I mean Hoover essentially realizes that that or, or comes to argue anyway that that you know his view is essentially that the only way out of the depression is through some form of international cooperation um, conferences are convened um, there is some efforts to deal with the issue of debt repayments, including the issue of German reparations, although that kind of almost you know, sort of disappears as an issue once Hitler comes to power. Um, on the other hand, you know, he really does fail to get a grip on the domestic situation inside the United States. And as a consequence of that, Hoover loses the 1932 election uh, to Franklin Roosevelt. Who comes to power in the spring of 1933? I say spring because um, back then um, a new administration started, I believe, around sometime in March. Okay, so a little bit later than than, than, than happens uh, today. Um, and a couple of things to say about Roosevelt. We may, we'll talk more about his biography. Um, his personality and politics and all the rest of it in rather more detail when we have our seminar discussion in a couple of days time. Um, essentially though, Roosevelt comes in promising, as he puts it, bold experimentation. So in other words, he, was, he viewed himself very much as an activist American president best remembered, of course, today for his so-called New Deal. Um, one of the things I think that comes clear, I mean, I've read a couple of biographies of Roosevelt, one, one of the things that comes in is that he doesn't really have a sort of systematic program. So a lot of the initiatives that he adopts in the economic sphere in the 30s are pretty ad hoc. Nonetheless, um, as I say, Roosevelt um, and yeah, as the slide mentions here, almost as soon as he comes in, he's confronted with a World Economic Conference, which is convened in London. There's discussion about um, some form of multilateral um, action to deal with it. The thing about Roosevelt, though, is that although he was interested in, you know, a very sort of creative approach, if I can put it that way, to the domestic economy. He was much less interested in some sort of multilateral action to deal with the crisis. You know, he seemed to believe that the roots of America's economic salvation lay at home in the domestic sphere and was altogether rather less interested in cooperating with other industrialized economies in trying to find a way out from the crisis. As a result of that, you know, there isn't a really a major um, solution yeah, a major initiative does not come out of the conference in uh, in 1933. Um, a couple of other things before we move on and get into the uh, how um, 
the Roosevelt administration deals with the various problems arising in the 1930s. Um, first thing to say is his first administration, so 33 to 37, foreign policy does not figure very prominently um, in terms of the administration's ag agenda. <coughs> uh, understandably, Roosevelt's priority is the domestic economic crisis. As I say, foreign policy does, is not you know, a major feature of uh, Roosevelt's first term as American president. Um, the one major, or the one quite important initiative in that period, though, in, in, in the realm of foreign affairs was the so-called good neighbor policy in relation to Latin America, you know, Roosevelt trying to improve um, America's relations with various countries in its own backyard. Um, aside from that, though, as I say, there isn't, you know, there isn't much in the way of enthusiasm for activist American policy. Um, again, we'll talk a little bit about Roosevelt's own personal philosophy when it comes to foreign affairs. But as I say, the circumstances that, is, that are confronting the United States, you know, early to mid 1930s are such that, um, as I said, the federal government is mainly concerned with uh, managing the American economy. Um, another factor important is that um, you know, politically isolationist opinion is very, very um, prominent in this period. As I said, their Congress was an isolationist stronghold. You have things like the Nye Commission, which essentially um, was convened to examine the reasons why the United States went to war in 1917 and essentially concludes that it was pressure from American economic interests and particularly the armaments industry which which sort of pitchforked America into the war. The overwhelming feeling domestically is that the United States should avoid being drawn into another European war. One consequence of this is that in the 1930s Congress passes several neutrality acts, all of which are basically designed to limit how the federal government, in other words the Roosevelt administration, can respond to international crises. Um, one I think which is passed in 1935 um, deals essentially basically Congress passes it and it basically stipulates that if an international conflict breaks out the United States cannot supply either party with weaponry so the United States would be prohibited from selling weapons to either of the parties um, um, uh, which were which were uh, you know which were at war you know other the belligerents um, Roosevelt was not happy about this legislation, uh, not least because it essentially um, eliminated the possibility of responding with some form of discretion, either you know punishing a country which uh, was perceived as an aggressor or giving assistance to the victim. However, Roosevelt, um, you know, Roosevelt reluctantly signs it. You know, he chooses not to veto the legislation, mainly because he does a deal with Congress and senators in which he essentially says, you know, I will sign the neutrality acts as long as you support me on some of my New Deal legislation. Um, subsequently, though, he comes to regret it. We'll get on to uh, Ethiopia in a moment. Um, for now, though, it's also important to note, obviously, that when Roosevelt comes in, it's becoming increasingly clear that the international situation is deteriorating. In fact, you know, the indications for this are beginning, are, you know, were becoming apparent even before Roosevelt becomes president. I suppose the first major international crisis, which sort of sets the scene for the rest of the 1930s, is the Japanese um, invasion of Manchuria in 1931. Um, I remember one of my old lecturers kind of noting that in some ways the tragedy of the 1930s is that the first major international crisis occurs outside Europe. Um, in 1931 
very few countries were very re reluctant to come down too heavily on the Japanese. Manchuria, which obviously was part of China, was not perceived as being, um, you know, a particularly important. Um, instead, and I suppose this becomes a sort of feature of the 1930s, um, an international commission is um, established to look into the roots of the uh, of the crisis. Eventually, this is the so-called Lytton Commission, um, which the Roosevelt administration participates in. Again, you know, which means that you know its isolationist posture has to be qualified. They eventually do come out um, and essentially say that Japan is the main aggressor, aggressor which um, creates a great deal of anger and resentment in Japan. As a consequence of that, Japan withdraws from the League of Nations. Um, and, you know, in so doing, essentially, they kind of achieve the worst possible scenario. You know, they, they manage to, as I said, anger the Japanese, but very, but don't do anything to really uh, provide much in the way of assistance to the Chinese. But it does set a precedent, you know, it's, it sets a precedent that a revisionist power is challenging, you know, the post-World War I international order. And when it comes to it, as I say, the, you know, the international community and especially the so-called status quo powers, the British, the French, to some extent, the United States, none of these powers are, reluct are willing to take forceful action to prevent Japan. Um, and of course, you know, Germany and Italy, uh, you know, um, possibly other powers, sort of take note of its precedent. Um, Nazis come to power in Germany, beginning of 1933. So the Roosevelt administration basically more or less sort of coincides with Hitler's uh, rise to power and eventually his fall to power, fall from power, I should say, in 1945. Um, Roosevelt comes into office a couple of months after Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany. Uh, eventually he dies a few weeks before Hitler commits suicide in 1945. So as I said, the two, you know, the two leaders period in office more or less coincide. Um, it's not until, well, the mid thirties though, that Germany's challenge to the post first, first World War order begins to become apparent. Um, 1935, Hitler announces that Contrary to the Versailles Treaty, Germany will now begin rearming. In reality, they've been rearming in secret for quite some time, but now Hitler was, you know, basically flouting the Versailles Agreement very publicly. Following year, the Rhineland again in breach of the Versailles Treaty is remilitarized. Um, the year before that, the Italy, Italy invades Ethiopia. So you have a series of challenges to the international order in the mid 1930s. And on each occasion, um, the response of Britain, France, the United States, the response is pretty weak, you know, pre pretty, pretty tepid in the way they deal with, the, with, the, with, with these challenges. Um, 1936 also witnesses the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War, which in some ways becomes a sort of proxy war um, in Europe with uh, you know, the fascist powers um, supporting Franco's nationalist forces in Spain, um, Soviets and other sort of left wing um, you know, parties tend to decide with the Republicans. Um, in the case of the Italian invasion of Ethiopia, in 1935, this in some ways, just to go back to the previous slide, in some ways this is the first um, <clears throat> test, I suppose, for the neutrality legislation. Um, when Roosevelt signs it, you know, he realizes that have, this crisis in Ethiopia had either begun or was on, on the verge of bursting onto the international scene. So Roosevelt realized that this, that uh, you know, the Italian invasion of Ethiopia was going to be a major, major crisis. He signs the neutrality legislation, though, because in the case of Ethiopia, it probably was not going to make a great deal of difference in terms of how the United States would respond. As I said, the neutrality legislation basically prohibited the United States from selling arms to either party. So either the aggressor or the, uh, the uh, you know, the victim. Um, 
in the case of Ethiopia, though, I mean, the country was too poor to purchase uh, weapons from the United States. So in that sense, the neutrality legislation wasn't going to make much difference. You know, Ethiopia with or without the legislation, Ethiopia was not, or Abyssinia, as it was then called, um, you know, Abyssinia was, the government there was going to be in no position to purchase uh, 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 weaponry from the United States. So in that sense, as I say, Roosevelt felt that he could afford to sign the legislation without it making too much difference. Um, on the other hand, <clears throat> on the other hand, um, Roosevelt, you know, the administration does not stop oil supplies to Italy, so it does not impose an oil embargo, probably the one, uh, you know, the one action the United States could have taken, which would have had, you know, a significant impact, let's say, on the Italian war effort. Um, Roosevelt refuses to, as I say, impose an arms embargo, although he does call upon um, American oil companies to voluntarily uh, suspend trading with Italy um, to little effect, it has to be said. So in other words, Roosevelt sort of saying, you know, I don't say to the oil companies, the executives there, you know, I don't want you to trade, but refusing to pass a law which would prohibit them from doing so. And of course, as I say, un unsurprisingly, Roosevelt's um, avails are conspicuously ineffective. Um, the situation in Europe begins to become increasingly ominous in the late 1930s, uh, not least because it's becoming clear that Germany and Italy, which until the mid to late 30s were not necessarily, did not necessarily view each other as natural allies. Um, from 1936 onwards, though, it's becoming increasingly clear that Italy is now sort of falling into the German orbit. Um, Pact of Steel, Germany and Italy, 1936. Then there is an anti comintern pact in which Japan also um, joins, uh, uh, you know, uh, first of all, Germany and then Italy, essentially promising that, you know, they would uh, uh, fight a defensive war against if, if, you know, if, if any one party was attacked by the Soviet Union. Um, so suddenly you have the two sort of fascist powers in Europe cooperating quite explicitly with Imperial Japan. Um, all of which sort of posed the question as to how the United States would actually respond to the situation, um, as well as how, of course, the British and the French, you know, as I said, the two sort of status quo powers in Italy, how they would also respond to the situation. Um, first one on this slide, yeah, deteriorating international situation meant that foreign policy became more prominent after 1937. Yeah, that's true. So whereas, as I say, in the first term of Roosevelt's administration, foreign policy was not a particularly significant feature of, uh, um, of you know, of the government's time in office. Second, second term, which, as I say, beginning of 1937 or spring of 1937 onwards, foreign policy suddenly begins to take over. Um, one thing that happens in 37, July 37, is that Roosevelt invites Chamberlain to meet with him and discuss the international situation. <coughs> Excuse me. Chamberlain though is reluctant to you know to accept this invitation um famously says it's it is best and safest to count on nothing from americans but words um uh, which again is an interesting response essentially saying that he did not believe that that uh, the, the roosevelt the roosevelt administration i should say this is neville chamberlain of course the british prime minister but essentially saying that you know that that, that, that uh, the British could not really expect too much from the American from the Americans. Chamberlain's got a lot of criticism from this. Although when you look at how events begin to pan out in the late 1930s, you, you know it's hard not to suspect that his assessment probably was not uh, it's not wrong. Um, moreover, I mean Chamberlain himself is beginning to embark upon several quite prominent. Um, from policy initiatives with the Axis powers. Um, 
And so in his response to Roosevelt, he essentially says, look, you know, let me deal with this for the time being, at least. Um, secret naval talks with Britain, though. So although the two leaders don't actually meet and formally start discussing how they might work together to deal with the international situation, um, the military, or at least the naval heads, are beginning to talk to each other in secret, um, notably about the situation in the Pacific. Obviously, um, Britain had colonial possessions, plenty, you know, large swathes of Asia belonged to Britain in the late 1930s. Um, the United States also obviously had quite pronounced interests in Asia and the Pacific. So there, you know, there are beginnings of secret talks. Um, furthermore, when the Sino-Japanese uh, War breaks out in 1937, an international conference is convened at Brussels to discuss the situation. Um, the United States also participates in that, again, indicating that you know, isolationism uh, was, well, I'm not sure if it was weakening, but certainly the United States was, you know, was perhaps not as isolationist as we sometimes suppose. The conference again condemns Japanese aggression, although, and again, you know, like in 1931, does not actually um, 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 provide, you know, did not actually move significantly against the uh, Japanese. Then you have a really interesting moment, and again, I want to come back to this in the um, the um, um, seminar, the discussion class we will have on Monday. Um, but Roosevelt gives a very famous speech, October 1937, which becomes known as the quarantine speech. Again, I, I, I'm going to pass over this very, very quickly for now, but it's something I really want to return to because I think it's important to um, think about why he gives this speech, the sort of domestic political circumstances which he was, uh, you know, uh, which, um, you know, I think, I think do have a sort of bearing on, uh, on uh, Roosevelt's um, um, statement here. And um, yeah, I thought I had a quotation from this speech, but I don't, but I, yeah, I mean, basically, I, as I say, I don't want to go into it too, in too much detail now, but essentially, um, and, you know, Perhaps I would suggest that maybe you guys have a you know, have a look into this, maybe um, have a quick glance at Wikipedia or whatever, so we've got some idea of of, of, of what he actually says. But yeah, he he puts this idea out there that perhaps aggressor states should be quarantined. So as I say, there's an interesting as I say, an interesting discussion to be had as to why does he give this speech, what does he mean, and you know what does that tell us about you know, end of November 1937 or autumn of 1937, you know, what is Roosevelt thinking in terms of the international situation? Moving on then, just uh, from that, as I, we will spend rather more time on the uh, on the quarantine speech in a couple of days' time. More generally, thinking about German-American relations in this time, I mean, again, I'm not going to summarise everything. It, the general point I would make is, yeah, there is some ambiguity, and I think that's sort of reflected in the readings for this class because you get different historians making slightly different arguments. Clearly there was not much in the way of sympathy for Nazi Germany because of its ideology. Um, and as the anti-Semitic nature of Nazi Germany <coughs> becomes increasingly apparent in the mid to late 1930s, that obviously has, you know, there is a sort of significant reaction to that in the United States. Also worth noting, Roosevelt's Treasury Secretary, Henry Morgenthau, you know, his family of German Jewish origin, so unsurprisingly, uh, were not at all, was not remotely sympathetic towards Nazi Germany. On the other hand, and this is where, you know, there's some ambiguity, an awful lot of business is nonetheless still conducted between the United States and Nazi Germany in the 1930s. So whatever, you know, whatever the, uh, um, you, you, you know, the political problems, the domestic you know, revulsion or whatever, um, it does not preclude the two countries continuing to do a fair amount of business. Um, there's been quite a lot of controversy to the extent to which, you know, American multinationals continue to, to uh, um, you know, work with German businesses and the German government and what have you. Moreover, <coughs> You also have Cordell Hull, the American Secretary of State, 
who I think it's fair to say was pretty isolationist in his outbreak, who essentially, you know, as the United States is looking at the at Nazi Germany systematically pulling apart the provisions in the Versailles Treaty, the American argument is that they are not parties to Versailles in the sense that the United States Senate hadn't ratified it, and therefore there was no obligation on the part of the United States to uphold um, you know, the provisions. Added to that, you've got America's relations with the Soviets. Roosevelt notable because he's the president who actually uh, establishes diplomatic relations with the Soviets. Um, again, I'm not going to go through every point here blow by blow, but the short summary of what the slide is, is you get the sense that both the Soviets and the Americans are beginning to look at each other as potential partners when it comes to managing um, Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. I say potential, I mean, I wouldn't want to put it any stronger than that. I mean, the idea that the two were going to be military allies at some point in the future, I don't, I suspect that weren't that many people taking this notion seriously. Nonetheless, you know, as I say, Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, these countries are being viewed as threats um, in the Soviet Union and in the United States. So there is a feeling that this might be an opportune moment for at least a partial reconciliation. So relations do improve. There's a, you know, there are negotiations surrounding um, the uh, um, uh, payment of uh, debts. Uh, you know, after the revolution, essentially the Bolsheviks kind of um, defaulted on all Russian debts to the United States. So there are sort of negotiations in the 1930s to try and settle settle that issue. On the other hand, I mean, Stalin's Russia uh, yeah, it was pretty deplorable, uh, you know, not much better than Nazi Germany. So which, you know, you know, becomes a factor. Also, of course, you have the purges in the 1930s, where you know millions and millions of people are sort of rounded up, arrested. Stalin purges anybody who he feels could be an enemy or indeed a rival to him. Um, late 30s, the Soviet military comes under the hammer, um, and Stalin takes the completely, you know, irrational, ludicrous decision to effectively decapitate his own military. Loads of senior Soviet officers just disappear. Um, and that's not lost on the United States. You know, there are genuine concerns that as a military power, the Soviet Union has been gravely weakened just at the moment that Nazi Germany is now really beginning to appear as a, you know, you know, as a major military threat on the international scene. Okay, so this takes us into the late 1930s then, and as I say, one of the most interesting questions, the extent to which Roosevelt supports America, sorry, support Britain's and France's policies of appeasement towards fascist Italy and Nazi Germany. Um, and as I say, the record here is pretty ambiguous. Photograph here of Neville Chamberlain with Hitler greeting somebody, I'm not entirely sure who. Um, and a quotation, July 1937. So as I say, 1937, this is the moment where it's becoming apparent that things are beginning to deteriorate um, all over Europe. Almost everybody feels that they are up against a stone wall and that there is nobody in Europe that can solve it. Therefore, it is perfectly logical thinking for them to look around for somebody outside of Europe to come forward with a hat and a rabbit in it. And they think, I got a hat with a rabbit in it. Well, that is about all there is to it. I haven't got a hat and I haven't got a rabbit. Essentially, I suppose Roosevelt here is saying that, saying to the Europeans that they could not expect the United States to intervene and solve their problems for them. Uh, first of all, what was appeasement? Again, we'll talk about this in a bit more detail. But essentially, I think um, the way I would tend to tend to think of appeasement is that there is, um, you know, well, first of all, I would say the word itself 
has very, very negative connotations today. You know, you talk about somebody being an appeaser, or we talk about appeasement, it has because of you know because of its track record, because of its association with the policies in the 1930s, which which ultimately obviously fail in a pr pretty spectacular fashion. Um, as I say, yeah, appeasement today has these very, very sort of negative uh, negative connotations. What was it though? I mean, it was essentially a policy. Um, of making concessions towards Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. Um, what it was not, though, I would argue, and other historians have argued, is a, is a policy of making sort of unlimited concessions. Um, there was basically a perception that perhaps Versailles had been too harsh, that Nazi Germany and fascist Italy perhaps did have some legitimate concerns, and that if um, that it might be possible to avoid another war if these were concessions concessions were made. Today, though, it's almost become synonymous with sort of cowardice um, and, you know, a policy of essentially of, you know, yeah, you make concessions, but you make concessions at the expense of other countries, you know, not at the expense of British and French um, interests. Um, you know, after, I suppose, you know, after the, you know, occupation of the Rhineland, incidentally, it should be said, the you know, occupation of the Rhineland in 1936 um, does not meet with any any real form of resistance from the British and French governments. You know, when Hitler gives the order to the German Wehrmacht, to the German military to kind of march into the Rhineland, um, he also gives an additional order for, for a full scale retreat if either if, if France or Britain began to mobilize their forces, um, but they don't. So, you know, it's a gamble, but it's a gamble that pulls off. But uh, so it's a gamble that um, that pays off, is what I'm looking for, uh, from Hitler's perspective. Um, March 1938, you have the so-called Anschluss uh, between Germany and Austria. Um, and again, I won't go into the details of that, aside to say that, you know, it's, it's another um, you know, German fait accompli initiative. And again, it meets, it, it does not meet with any real form of resistance from Britain or France. Um, the next major crisis, though, is involves Czechoslovakia and the Sudetenland. And that does, you know, that does become a serious crisis simply because Czechoslovakia has an alliance with France. So the French have a mil have an obligation to come to the defense of Czechoslovakia if German forces invade. Um, Britain, also an ally of France. So essentially, if France goes to war, then Britain would almost certainly have to follow suit. Um, so summer, early autumn, 1938. <clears throat> Um, you have, as the crisis ratchets up, <coughs> me, you have a series of international meetings, um, mainly involving the, uh, um, um, the British and the Germans. Chamberlain takes, a, takes the decision to meet with Hitler on several occasions to try and negotiate a solution. This culminates September 1938 in the Munich crisis, which basically involves Britain, France, Germany, um, Italy, um, and between them, they try and come, you know, they try and reach uh, a, a, a settlement. Ultimately, the agreement that they come up with is that Czechoslovakia would cede the Sudetenland to to uh, um, uh, to Germany, which was problematic for a number of reasons. But and again, we'll, we we will discuss this. Um, the British and French make it clear to the Czech government that they would not, that if the Czechs refused, they could not expect British and French support if the Germans marched in. So, you know, after a lot of pressure is put on, put on the Czechs very, very reluctantly concede. Um, and is yet another triumph of, uh, triumph of, uh, of, uh, triumph for Hitler. Although, interestingly, he does not see this at the time. You know, Hitler has sort of, by September 1938, has sort, of, has sort of more or less committed himself to war if need by, and feels, you know, sort of feels frustrated that Chamberlain has sort of robbed him 
of a full-scale military conquest in 1938. Chamberlain, anyway, comes back to London and is greeted as a hero. He is a man who, through the use of diplomacy, has managed to forestall a major war from breaking out in Europe. The interesting question, though, is Roosevelt and his own attitude towards what was going on. Obviously, the Americans were not present at the Munich conference. So the American government was not directly involved in the, uh, in, in the negotiations. And as I say, go back to Roosevelt's elusive quality. Now, Roosevelt appeared to be saying different things at different times. Um, so this quotation here, uh, which I think, if I remember, um, is made during the Munich conference, where Roosevelt describes Chamberlain as being slippery, you could not trust him under any circumstances, and that Chamberlain was playing the usual game of the British, peace at any price, and would try to place the blame on the United States for fighting or not fighting. Chamberlain was interested in peace at any price, if he could get away with it and save his face. Um, which you know, might not be a particularly unfair verdict, although, of course, Chamberlain could more or less say, if not the same to Roosevelt, then at least point to the Americans and say, well, you know, you, you are effectively in a position where you can sit out of any future war. Um, so that's, you know, that quotation suggests that Roosevelt had very little sympathy for what the British and the French were trying to achieve. On the other hand, as, the, as you know, as the negotiations continue, Roosevelt does actually start sending out telegrams urging the various parties to come to peace. And so I've certainly seen it argue that Roosevelt's attitude during the Munich conference, which lasted for several days, um, sort of evolves. Um, at the beginning, he has, you know, at, as the quotation we saw sort of suggests, he, he detests the idea of some kind of compromise emerging at Munich. As the conference goes on, and as it becomes apparent that perhaps an agreement might actually be possible, it should be said that, you know, to begin with, Roosevelt's pretty skeptical that an agreement can be reached. As it becomes apparent that they might actually do some kind of deal, then Roosevelt appears to become rather more supportive um, and indeed, after the conference end, Roosevelt, to some extent, tries to claim credit. You know, he says, you know, if only the world knew how important my role was. Obviously, yeah, a few months later, when the rest of Czechoslovakia has been swallowed by Nazi Germany and, you know, and, 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 and the Europeans are on the road to war over Poland, um, Roosevelt's pretty keen to distance himself from, uh, from you know, the, the toings and throwings of, of, of the Munich conference. But at the time, as I say, if you look at, you know, if you look at what he was saying to various people at the time, you know, there is some evidence to suggest that he was actually pretty supportive of the agreement that emerged from the Munich conference. Should also be noted that um, America's ambassador to Britain at that time was one Joseph Kennedy, father of the future president. Um, and Kennedy was 100% in favour of the appeasement policy and indeed was encouraging the British uh, to pursue um, um, this appeasement policy towards Nazi Germany. Uh, quotation, Chamberlain on Roosevelt in Munich. Um, there was one other power which was not represented at the conference and which nevertheless we felt to be exercising constantly increasing influence, I refer, of course, to the United States of America. Those messages of President Roosevelt so firmly and yet so persuasively framed showed how the voice of the most powerful nation in the world could make itself heard 3,000 miles, uh, heard across 3,000 miles of ocean and sway the minds of men in Europe. So Chamberlain himself certainly felt that the Americans had exercised some influence. Okay, this brings us on to 1939 then. As I say, a agreement has reached the Munich 1938. Chamberlain comes back as a hero. Um, Hitler promises that is his last territorial demand in Europe. And then a few months later, beginning of 1939, basically swallows up the rest of Czechoslovakia, contrary to his previous pro promises. Um, and this finally forces the British and French to kind of reconsider their appeasement policies. Um, and it's becoming increasingly apparent that it's probably only going to be a matter of time before another European war breaks out. 
Beginning of 1939, Roosevelt announces a massive rearmament program, at least massive by the standards of the time in terms of the United States. One demands a 1.3 billion appropriations of defense, which Congress reluctantly passes. As I say, it was not a done, if I remember correctly, I, I must admit, I probably have to should go back and um, check this in the uh, in the uh, in the literature. But if I remember correctly, you know, as I said, there there is still a fair amount of resistance in Congress to this to the beginnings of this sort of militarization of the, the United States. Military supplies sold to Britain and France, and Roosevelt, on several occasions, I think, called, suggests the idea that there should be some kind of international conference to deal with the situation, which again suggests that, you know, Roosevelt still believed that diplomacy could be used as an instrument to prevent a future war, which again, you know, not dissimilar to the policies that the British and the French had committed to. Had committed to. The problem is by 1939, very few people are actually interested in this, certainly not Hitler and Mussolini. On another occasion, I think this is the summer of 1939, Roosevelt suggests that Hitler and Mussolini promise not to um, invade. Uh, he presents a list of 31 countries and ask them to, to uh, um, make an explicit promise that they would not invade any of these countries. Um, the Americans also encouraged the British and the French to conclude some kind of alliance with the Soviet Union. Um, there are sort of fitful negotiations in the summer of 1939 involving the British and the French with the Soviets. The problem is the British especially are not particularly serious. And then out of the blue, Hitler launches his own major foreign policy initiative when he basically suggests to Stalin that he send his own foreign minister to Moscow, Ribbentrop, to conclude um, an agreement with the Soviets, which be obviously becomes the Nazi-Soviet pact. Um, included in the pact is a secret protocol, which basically, the, you know, there's a secret agreement in which Poland uh, would be annexed and divided um, by be, between the two countries, between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. Um, when this is revealed, it basically you know, blows out of the water any possibility of a, you know, of, a, of, a of a British or French alliance with the Soviets. Um, so this basically sets the scene. I should also say I haven't put it on the slide, but of course, famously, Britain, along with France, gives. Um, a territorial guarantee to Poland, March the 31st, 1939, essentially saying to Poland that were Nazi Germany to invade, they could count on British and French military support. Um, so yes, this effectively sets the stage for the future European war. Um, and as I say, in the, in the discussion class, you know, there's a few things which I passed over very quickly. As I say, the uh, quarantine speech and why you know why does Chamberlain so why does Chamberlain why does Roosevelt give this speech in uh, the autumn of 1937? Um, there's certainly much more we can say about uh, appeasement and you know, Roosevelt's role during the Munich Conference and in, and in general you know American America's attitude towards Nazi Germany, especially um, in this uh, in this period. Okay, I'll uh, bring it to an end there. And as I say, we will discuss some of these points in rather more detail um, in a few days' time.